it is both a pleasure and an honor to, to welcome the senator. He has some comments, and then he'll take some questions. So, Senator McCain. Well, thank you, Robin, <coughs> for that kind introduction, and thank you for not mentioning that I lost running for President of the United States. I thank you for that. I want to thank the uh, German Marshall Fund, the Free University of Tbilisi, and the Agricultural University of Georgia for putting together this important and timely conference on Georgia and for inviting me to here to speak with you. I'm uh, honored that you would ask a member of Congress uh, to address you on any issue. As you know, the Congress approval ratings are down to 9%. Um, you know, I used to uh, joke that we were down to paid staffers and blood relatives, but I received a call from my mother who is 101 years old, and we are now down to paid staffers. So, <coughs> <coughs> and all this is to say that uh, we in the U.S. Congress and the U.S. government have even more reason than usual these days to be humble when commenting on the challenges facing other countries and how they should address them. It is in this spirit that I'd like to offer a few thoughts this morning about Georgia, a country for which I have developed an enormous affection over the years. I love Georgia. I love its people and its natural beauty, its culture and its history. I'm a friend of Georgia and its citizens, and my commitment to Georgia is not determined by whatever leader or party or government happens to be in power. Above all of that, I care what is best for the nation and people of Georgia. <clears throat> in the midst of an historic transition in Georgia, now is an ideal time to step back and reflect on this broader question, to take stock of how much Georgians have achieved, and to reflect on the many challenges that still remain. This conference is an ideal opportunity to do just that, and it could not come at a better time. What is now unfolding in Georgia is a, is a momentous event in the history of that country and indeed its entire region. The overwhelmingly peaceful transition of political power from one democratically elected government to another at a time when so many countries across the world are struggling and often failing to lay the foundation of democratic governance when political power is still the source of so much social unrest and even violence. Georgia, in many ways, is an inspiration for the world. Georgia's transition is a critical milestone in what has been a decade of political and economic progress that few could have imagined in 2003 when Georgians rose up by the tens of thousands to demand that their voices be heard and their votes counted amid the previous government's attempt to deprive them of both. Over the past decade, thanks to the hard work and dedication of the Georgian people, a reformist government has transformed an authoritarian state with a closed and stagnant economy into a democratic system with a vibrant market-based economy. Georgia's infrastructure has improved. Its economy is being liberalized. Its democracy is deepening and becoming more transparent and accountable to Georgia's citizens. And it has implemented police reforms that are the model for other emerging democracies seeking to reform their security sectors. I remember traveling to Georgia prior to the Rose Revolution, and it was not safe, literally, to walk the streets of Tbilisi. Today, petty crime and, and corruption are down considerably. These reforms have unleashed a period of unprecedented economic growth in Georgia. According to the World Bank, Georgia is now the eighth best country in the world to do business. And Transparency International has found that Georgia is seen as less corrupt than many current members of the European Union. What's more, Georgia is drawing on its newfound success to support other nations that are struggling with their own historic transitions. Georgia, for example, has contributed thousands of its own troops to the NATO mission in Afghanistan, a contribution that exceeds that of NATO members with many times its population. Georgia's democratic and economic progress is an achievement by all Georgians, and it should fill all Georgians with immense pride. 
At the same time, one person deserves a few words of special praise, and that is President Misha Saakashvili. It was President Saakashvili's idealism that helped inspire his fellow Georgians in 2003 to seize their democratic future. It was his vision that helped to guide Georgia through a decade of reforms that have transformed the country. It was his commitment to Georgia's democratic destiny that helped to ensure that a transition of power would occur through fee, free and fair elections. And it's a testament <coughs> to President Saakashvili's love of country that after his party lost those elections, he committed nonetheless to hand over power to his rivals, a promise he is keeping. We must hope that the incoming president can do as much for Georgia through his victory as President Saakashvili has done by how he has handled his defeat. That is not to say that President Saakashvili and his government have always been perfect. They have not. We recognize that mistakes have been made along the way. And 10 years after the Rose Revolution, it is clear that the Georgian people are eager for change as they embark on the next step in their country's journey. It is also clear that their expectations of their new government are higher than ever, and they should be. Georgia still faces significant political, economic, and social challenges, and there's much work to be done to ensure that Georgia continues to institutionalize its democracy and sustain the momentum of its economic reforms. At the same time, some recent developments in Georgia are not the kinds of changes that we believe the Georgian people either desire or deserve. It's alarming, for example, to see the increase in political violence that has occurred in Georgia, especially in the run-up to and since and since last month's election. There are also reports of growing government pressure on important civil society institutions, such as the media and universities. Similarly, recent detention, detentions and prosecutions of some former government officials appear selective and politically motivated. Justice must be done and laws must be followed but the pursuit of justice should always be carried out in a way that strengthens democracy and the rule of law rather than undermining these principles. No government should ever use the institutions of the state as tools of political retribution. Doing so is not only corrosive to democracy and social trust, it's also a powerful deterrent to the kinds of international investment that a country like Georgia desperately needs to thrive. Just as Georgian people have high expectation for their country and their government, so too do Georgia's closest friends and allies. We will continue to hold Georgia to the highest democratic standards, the same standards to which the Georgian people clearly wish to hold themselves and their leaders. And we expect the incoming Georgian government to build on the progress of the past decade, especially maintaining Georgia's trajectory toward a Euro-Atlantic future. This is a future that Georgians still clearly want for their country. It appears that the Georgian government is on track to sign an association agreement with the European Union later this month, which will enable Georgia to trade freely with the EU and bring Georgia one big step closer to potential membership in the EU. This would be enormously positive. The United States and our European allies also need to reaffirm our commitment to Georgia's aspiration of joining NATO. At the same time, Georgia's government needs to understand that membership in the Euro-Atlantic community is not an inherent right. It is a privilege that can and should be extended only if the Georgian government continues to demonstrate a commitment to the democratic values at the heart of our Euro-Atlantic alliance. After backsliding on democracy, the Ukrainian government now finds itself in tense negotiation with the European Union, in which its integration with the West could be in jeopardy. We should not want to see the same thing happen in Georgia. For us, this is not about forcing Georgia to choose its relationship with one country or group of countries over another. Georgia is an independent country that should make its own sovereign decisions about its future. We do not see these as zero-sum choices. Unfortunately, 
Not all of Georgia's neighbors share this view. For the past five years, Georgia has been a dismembered country with Russian troops illegally occupying sovereign Georgian territory in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. What's worse, Russia is building military bases on this land and engaging in shameless provocations such as erecting barbed wire fences and embankments along the administrative lines and even pushing those lines themselves deeper inside of Georgia. Russia's occupation of Georgia is an outrage and an injustice that makes a mockery of core principles of the international order that responsible nations have sought to build during the past seven decades. It should end now. Nevertheless, the will of the Georgian people remains strong to resist Russia's occupation and other Russian attempts at coercion and intimidation. Indeed, Earlier this year, Georgia's parliament unanimously rejected the prospect of membership in the Russian-led Eurasian Union, a goal that Moscow has been using economic pressure and other strong-arm tactics to achieve. This is all the more reason why it is so important that Georgians to continue to work to come together and strengthen their democracy. A Georgia that is strong and united at home is best positioned to uphold its sovereign rights as an independent nation in the world. Now some in this country and elsewhere may nonetheless be tempted to ask, who cares? Why should I care about the future of a small country on the other side of the world? I'd like to try to explain why I believe that we, why we must care. For many decades now, some of the finest statesmen and leaders of the Euro-Atlantic Alliance have nurtured a powerful dream the dream of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. This dream took root in the wreckage of the Second World War. It was delayed by the long twilight struggle against communism. It was tested but affirmed through the expansion of democracy and free market principles into Eastern and Central Europe following the end of the Cold War. It was tested again and again reaffirmed through a decade of conflict in the Balkans. Now, after so much loss and sacrifice in Europe's past, the prospect of realizing once and for all the vision of a Europe whole, free, and at peace finally seems at hand. We need to care about realizing this long-sought goal. We have to care, not just because it's the right thing to do, though right it is, not just because it is our economic benefit, though benefit us it does, and not just because our friends and partners in places like Georgia and Moldova and Ukraine and Azerbaijan desire it for their own sake, though desire it they do. No, we Americans should care about the democratic process of these countries and the realization of a Europe whole, free, and at peace because this makes our country safer and our world more secure. If the history of the last century teaches us anything, it is that no nation benefits more from the spread of democratic values in the world than America itself. Similarly, threats to those values may seem distant at first, but if allowed to gather and grow, they can become larger challenges that we are compelled by our national interests to address. That is the price of isolationism and the failure to lead. Most Georgians share this value of a Europe whole, free, and at peace, and especially their country's place within it. President Saakashvili's government has brought the country to the doorstep of this historic opportunity for Georgia and for us. Now it is up to Georgia's new government to move their country through that window of opportunity. That is the choice that most Georgians want to make, and I, along with all of Georgia's friends, will be with them every step of the way. Thank you very much. The Senator has um, graciously um, accepted to take some questions uh, from the floor. Do you want to take them from yeah. the podium? Yeah, okay. Um, we have about 10 minutes, so please, su please succinct in your questions, and um, please go ahead for the Senator. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> if 
answered all the questions. <laughs> there you go, please. <coughs> Senator, um, uh, many people uh, in Georgia have these uh, concerns that for a set of different reasons, U.S. Uh, uh, in general, you, U.S. people, U.S. political elite are l losing interest towards Georgia or generally towards our part of the world. So do you think it's uh, uh, some kind of uh, long-term irreversible trend or, uh, or it's more about taste, taste <coughs> of specific politicians and uh, administration? Well, I, I think that there are many Europeans that think we haven't lost interest uh, in them, especially those who have had their conversations eavesdropped on. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think that it's not so much a matter of losing interest in Europe as it is that there's so much turmoil in the Middle East that a lot of our attention has been directed there, obviously. We have an incredibly tense and difficult situation that we are going through right now with the Iranian issue, not to mention Syria, the spread of radical Islam, the jihadists, the uh, Al-Qaeda resurgence throughout the Maghreb and throughout Northern Africa and the Middle East. So I think part of it is because that it seems to be what dominates I think uh, for a whole variety of reasons, Georgia has kind of a special place in the minds of a lot of Americans. Uh, the Rose Revolution, the, 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 the enthusiasm of the people, the beauty of the country, the, the, the so many remarkable changes that were brought about under the government of Misha Saakashvili. Again, I can remember being in Tbilisi under the previous government and literally it not being safe to walk the streets in daytime uh, it was in Tbilisi without fear, without having security around. And they've come a long, long way. And now the people are in another transition. So I think there's a special feeling about Georgia. I think that the economic issues have dominated to a large degree the European agenda, but um, it's not so much that we've lost interest, it's that the, our focus now understandably is on the crises that we are now facing. I, I was over at the White House for a long time yesterday talking with the President about the Iranian sanctions issue. This is a real crisis as as you know, so it's it's more of a of it, the events are being thrust upon us rather than us losing interest. And again, I continue to, as most people who know, be outraged at the blatant occupation of a sovereign nation, which Mr. Putin seems to especially enjoy. Thank you very much. There on the left, gentlemen. Uh, Senator McCain, another question on the same theme. Uh, does the United States have the bandwidth if it rebalances or pivots towards Asia to maintain the commitment to the Europe that, that you described? I believe so. Um, the world's, the reality is the world's economy is shifting to the Asia Pacific region. That's indisputable by the facts. And we now have a, the second world superpower in China rising in not always a fashion that we, uh, in a fashion that in some ways is a bit uh, of concern, particularly the issue of the South China Sea. Um, so I think it's understandable. I think the word pivot was a huge mistake. Uh, uh, it, it, it gave, I think, the wrong impression. And it does not so much as our shifting our assets as it is as shifting some of our attention and our effort to the Asia Pacific region. So, you know, sometimes we shape events and sometimes our actions shape events 
and situations and sometimes events shape us. And right now, the opposite is true. And I could go into all the reasons for that. Part of it is a lack of United States leadership, but it's no doubt that the focus is on these events in the Middle East, whether it be uh, Egypt, the heart and soul of the Arab world, which many of us think is reverting back to a quasi-military dictatorship, to the crisis in Iran, to the slaughter in Syria. Uh, relations between the United States and Israel arguably have never been more strained. So there is that attention, but it's also understandable. But I believe that long term, the United States of America has to be much more involved in the Asia Pacific region. Our economic interests are there and a lot of the challenges uh, uh, that I can see throughout the future uh, reside there. In the United States, I still believe, is the indispensable nation. Thank you. Maybe one more question here. Uh, 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 the McCain Institute's uh, Next Generation Leader Servo. Senator, thank you very much for your very strong support to my country. Uh, and since the questions were asked about uh, uh, European uh, uh, dimension as well as the Asian one, my question is uh, about the Eurasian Union and union that Russia is trying to uh, reconstruct and, uh, uh, for, for the continuation of the Soviet Union. Uh, you convey to the Georgian public and also those countries who are pressed to be part of this union? Thank you. I thank you for that question because I believe this week or next uh, um, Ukraine will make a decision which will have, I think, profound consequences for a long period of time. Our friend Dr. Kissinger often has said Ukraine, uh, Russia with Ukraine is a Western power, and without Ukraine is an Eastern power. I think when you look at the history and the role that Ukraine has played uh, throughout the 20th and even the 19th century, it's a very key country, not just because of its size, but of its <coughs> location. And if Mr. Yanukovych makes a decision this week or next to join the, uh, quote, customs, Union, I think it will have significant uh, consequences. It's complicated by the future of Yulia Tymoshenko, as you know. Um, but uh, it, I think this is really kind of a seminal moment uh, that will have repercussions for for many years. I believe that Mr. Putin has visions, even though he has the world's 13th largest economy, and despite the fact that he has severe demographic uh, problems, despite the fact that his economy is based on the price of a boy, b barrel of oil, I think he still has great visions of the near abroad. When you talk to our Baltic friends, particularly Lithuania, but also Latvia and Estonia, you'll see pressures being exerted there. We see what he's doing in Georgia. You could see where they just levered the Armenians into joining their, quote, customs union or whatever that they, they want to call it. I think he has great ambition to remain in power for life, and I think he has great ambitions to restore the, quote, near abroad. I don't think that means that he's going to, that there's going to be a war, or there, there's going to be a conflict. I don't think that. But I think he will exert as much pressure as he can to restore this old vision of a, uh, of a Russian empire. I think a good example of the contempt with which he seems to hold us is the Snowden case. Um, there was really no reason why he should take Mr. Snowden into his country <clears throat> and welcome him and treat him as a rock star. And there's many other ways that the Russians or Putin could have handled the issue of Snowden. Instead, he chose it in a way that would most explicitly stick his thumb on our eye. So um, I respect Vladimir Putin. I just think we ought to understand who he is, what he was, and what his ambitions are. And 
every chance we get, that I get, at any extended conversation, we should express the outrage that Russia occupies a sovereign nation. And they move the fences, and they move in the military, and they do all kinds of, of things that uh, uh, are just, again, uh, not in keeping with the international rules of behavior. And um, I don't see any real improvement in those relations until Mr. Putin begins to respect us more. And I think the best way for him to respect us is for us to show a unified front, all of us, in regards to our relations to Russia. And again, I'm not saying there, there would be a confrontation. I'm not saying there would be conflict. But there are many, many ways that we can um, reduce the pressures that Mr. Putin is able to lever on surrounding nations. And the first priority would be to help these countries become independent of Russian energy. I want to say thank all of you. Um, if you are looking for a place to uh, vacation next summer, I recommend Batumi. Uh, it's a very uh, fun place to go and uh, a lot of nice people there. In fact, you'll meet a lot of Iranians there when you're, <laughs> when you're there. And, uh, and in the mountains of, uh, of Georgia is also some very beautiful place. We now have an, a little airfield up there to the, I'm trying to think of it. Yeah. To be, it's also a beautiful place uh, to visit. This uh, message is brought to you by the Georgian Institute for Tourism. Thank you very much. <laughs>